Hi everyone, um, great to be here and just want to start by saying a huge thank you to John T and all the volunteers and to everyone just because EMF is just a fantastic place to be, so uh, just start there. Um, also going to start with some stories, uh, this poster uh, was taken, uh, the photograph here, there is no Photoshop involved, uh, it's a friend of my, a late friend of mine uh, called Chris Wainwright who went to the Arctic and was bobbing around in the middle of, a, uh, of the sea taking pictures of icebergs with huge red flash guns. Uh, so this is a, an as-is photograph uh, called Burning Ice. Uh, and that's very much the, the, the kind of theme of, of today is that the time of, for theory is over and how are we going to actually address uh, the climate issue is, is front of mind. Just a, by way of orientation, a, a bit of the, the journey that I've found myself taking over the last couple of decades now. Um, set up a, a, a carbon calculation firm uh, in the mid-2000s uh, with some of the people here, um, helped set up the Open Data Institute, uh, helped create a thing called the Open Banking Standard, um, and so you'll see a bit of a theme there of, of data uh, as the thing and, and getting more and more access to it and trying to uh, enable people to use it. Um, and, and here we are again, so what, what's, what's different from when I kind of started on this and uh, you know, near on 20 years ago, is well, the data is just as much of a mess as it was uh, back then. You know, we, we have, we're, most people are still working on spreadsheets, uh, and it's it's not a, a great um, a great starting point. But we have got some some things that are different, and I think when we look at um, what is the role of the uh, hacker community and uh, what does hacking mean in this context, I think it's broader than just tech hacking, although you know, we need developers uh, in the mix here. We need people who are good at social hacking, good at financial hacking, as in creating different types of finance and hacking policy, actually working out how we can rewrite things uh, to be uh, more effective. And on that sort of journey over uh, the years, I've, I've got more involved uh, sitting in between bits of government, you know, Bayes and Ofgem, the energy regulator, uh, working with the Financial Conduct Authority, or the pensions regulator, the Bank of England, those kind of people, through to BlackRock, you know, have got all the money, you sit in these rooms and there's people who are, are in control, basically, of trillions of dollars uh, of, uh, of finance. And they're all asking the same question. I think one of the things that is materially different is that the people in those rooms are genuinely trying to find a way forward um, but I'm going to talk to you here to some of those challenges. So today's talk's mostly about pointers and ideas and, and things you can do to get uh, more informed about where the levers of change are around uh, climate. And we definitely, you know, this, this needs everyone. But I want to start off with just some straightforward things that everybody can do. And I call this, uh, there was a friend of mine many years ago said a, a thing called do the green thing. And actually, I think here there's a, there's a framing of do the dull thing. So the, a lot of this is about plumbing and looking at the financial uh, ecosystem in which we exist and saying, what can we do to affect where the money flows? Because that's going to dictate how we invest and what the carbon footprint of everything is. Just to put a frame around this, the, the organizations that, ha that have, are able to think for more than a few years even into the decades, are quite narrow in their uh, scope. Pension funds and insurance uh, companies are among the small number of groups that have to think on in a time scale of decades. And when you think we've got a, a legally binding target now in the UK and other countries around the world, to hit net zero by 2050, actually most of that footprint is going to be baked in in the next decade, in fact, in this decade. Because all of the infrastructure, the power systems, the transport systems, the water systems, agriculture, etc., that we embed tend to last for decades. So we've got to do something now to redirect that capital flow. So I'm going to flip here between money, uh, tech, data as we go through this, but three straightforward actions you can do is call up your bank or your insurer, or if you've got pension, call up your pension provider and ask them what are their net zero commitments, right? What are they, and, and what do they actually mean by them? You'll see a lot of very, if you go to the, the kind of corporate websites, you'll see lots of PDF files with lots of pretty images in them, but there's very little in the, by the, in the way of um, 
tangible commitments to this amount of reduction by this date. Or yes, we're heading towards net zero by 2050 as a general sort of statement, as a target, but the roadmap and the plan of how to get there is less clear. And that's because we don't know. So it's not that they're necessarily trying to hide anything, it's like it's really actually quite difficult. But what we need to be asking is how are they going to demonstrate those measures? How are they going to measure their progress and what does success look like? Uh, and then a really provocative question is how is the chief executive's pay and the boards and the um, senior executive teams pay linked to hitting those targets. Now th these are quite, um, you know, th these are all about, about creating the right incentives. You know, if we have a million people calling up a pension provider and saying, we want to know these things, they're gonna really pay attention. Uh, and I, I want to also emphasize, you should be asking this question of your own organizations. Go to your CFO, go to your finance team, go to your marketing team and say, what do you really think? Take them out for a beer, go out for a cup of coffee and say, what's really going on here? Do we believe our own rhetoric here? Are we actually doing something material? And are we going to deliver net zero or are we just heading towards a lower carbon future? Because that's quite a different thing. I think we're well on track to being lower carbon, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Uh, and there's a great uh, clip which I strongly recommend you uh, going to uh, look up from the two Ronnies. It's as you can tell from the, the screenshot here, it's a, it's, a, it's a very old clip. But one of my reflections here is that in talking to everybody, and I feel like I've really been through the whole system, you talk to people really low down in an organization, they desperately want to do something about climate change. Now, whether their sense of agency is um, introducing recycling or helping to uh, get renewable energy on board, there's still a sense of frustration, oh, well, it's my boss that is the issue. So you go and talk to them, and they say, well, it's not really me, it's the senior management. Senior management say, oh, it's not really us, it's up to the uh, chief, uh, chief executive or the C-suite. Uh, and they, you go to the C-suite and the chief executive say, well, it's actually up to the board if we don't get the board on, on to make the decision here. And the board then say, well, it's the shareholders. Uh, it's the pension funds. And then the pension funds say, well, we're regulated to make sure that the people in the organization have a pension. So we've got to take a really high risk analysis here of where do we invest? And if you look back over the last 100 years, very simple equation, which is typically done on spreadsheets, the returns from oil and gas are more predictable than the returns from solar and renewables, just because there's more data. So there, there's a loop. So you're right back at the, the, the beginning of that journey. So we all need to individually say, we give you permission uh, to these uh, pension funds and, and, and so on to say, we want to see these changes. We want you to invest differently. Yes, we know there's risk associated with that. But linked with that, we also need to change the regulation because I was sitting down with a number of the banks. They say, well, we're regulated, we're not allowed to take risk. If we take too much risk and people can prove it, we get fired or we get fined or in some cases we go to jail, right? So there, there is a huge amount of fiduciary responsibility, legal responsibility uh, in these organizations to make sure that everything stays s s stable. Uh, and the challenge there is when you start looking at the systems risk that we're facing, it's massive. So here it's not a technology problem, it's more of a social problem about our sense of individual agency in the mix. So next time you're thinking, what can I do? Yes, do the solar panel thing, do the renewable energy, do your recycle, all of those things, but also call up uh, those, the people who control your money, because they're the ones making those high level decisions. And this is a description of our economy. It's quite straightforward. We only back things that, where the line goes up. Right, that, that, this is still true. We don't like lines that go down. I don't know, it's kind of really dumbing it down, but that's been my experience. Unless you can show a line going up, we don't get the engagement because economists don't like to see efficiency. Right? We want to see growth. We're in a growth economy. Now, we might be able to refactor capitalism, but we're not going to do it in the next eight years. So we need to find out how other ways of, of uh, influencing this system. But we also need to take in mind, in, into perspective here that we have got um, a situation where we're doing the same thing over and over again, and that is kind of the definition of insanity. And at the same time, things are as simple as they're going to be. 
everything from this from today forward, and this is always true, from today forward it's only going to get more complex. Uh, you know, this time last year we were wrestling with uh, COVID. Uh, we wouldn't have necessarily predicted, uh, predicted the war in Ukraine. So all of these things create multiple factors, which when you're already in a stress situation, which the financial systems, our economies, our societies already are, trying to take on board these additional things just makes things more and more complicated. So we now have to try and start thinking differently about how we're going to imagine the future. Now, there are changes. So at COP last year, uh, the climate conference, um, the um, various groups announced they're going to follow a thing called TCFD. It's climate-related financial disclosures. Most large companies, your pension funds, are now mandatory, required to publish a report that says what their climate risks are. And I'm going to come on to that a little bit more uh, in a moment. But fundamentally, finance, how finance uses the data, you've got this really interesting kind of mix of quantitative information and qualitative information. And there's a lot of things under the hood of that. And what I wanted to drill into a little bit today is the difference between our financial economy and, a, and the real economy. And that language tells you a lot of things that are fairly self-evident. But I think this is one of the um, learnings that I, I, I bring today is that our financial economy really looks at financial variables. So this is things like your hedge funds, share prices, interest rates, and they're all geared to line goes up. And then underneath that, you've got the real economy, which is the non-financial elements of our economy, which are things that we produce, uh, and the flow of goods and things like that. So those two things are now having to come together in ways that they haven't really had to before. Now, I'm going to just pause there and come back into you know, what's at stake here. You know, when we think about risk, and this is where companies and our economy isn't really geared up to thinking on these time frames because they're looking at next quarter's results or the next two years or the next three years rather than the next 10, 20, 30 years. But we are looking at you know, what is at stake in this century, so in the lifetime of some of the people in this room. Um, and the scientific community here is incredible. There's tens of thousands of people working on the actual climate science, working on what are the implications. Um, but science really struggles to communicate to finance and to politics in a way that is meaningful and, and has traction. And the language of the IPCC reports, the international uh, group that looks at uh, climate, has got more and more uh, blunt over the years. Basically, they've gone from a, like, oh, there's a significant risk, or it's unequivocal. You know, when a scientist says something is 70% likely, they mean this is going to happen, but they tend not to stand on the table and sort of wave flags. If you say 70% likely to a politician, they go, oh, okay, so it's 50-50 then, uh, or it's probably 40-60 in my favor, or, or something like that. Uh, it, it, there's a real translation gap. But this, the science here is, is really quite unequivocal, which we've heard for ages. And you can see that um, when we have stresses on our system, so this dip here at the top right of our emissions over time, the dip there was COVID. So COVID did actually stop us doing this. It radically reduced our consumption and our emissions, but not as much as we might have expected. Um, in fact, that also played out over uh, different um, uh, industries and, and sectors in different ways. You can see a massive dip there in the uh, ground surface transport, uh, aviation, so on. Residential went up a bit, uh, of course. And you can see these uh, differences over time uh, through what's called extreme confinement at home. So stop doing things. Now, this is something to learn from. We, we need to stop doing things as well as investing into renewables and all, all the other PCs. There's a billion cars on the road worldwide right now. If we're going to switch them all of them to EVs, we're actually going to create a huge footprint just from the creation of the vehicles, never mind the creation of everything else. So we have to work out how we're going to do mobility differently and so on. Because the curve here needs to do this. Now, if you're in an economy where line goes up and the line going up in the economy generates emissions, even if you're switching huge amounts of capital, and you look at a dip like COVID and say, well, we've just bounced back to roughly where we were before. 
something radical has to shift. So we have to start thinking about how do we make the line going up really deliver net zero? How can we refactor that? So there's a hack in there somewhere, a psychological hack, to have a line that somehow goes up that takes us to net zero. And it's not just investment in renewable energy, it's also some kind of form of efficiency and some form of reduction, where actually the line's going down, but somehow it looks like it's going up. So I'll leave that as a, an exercise for the reader. Um, so what we're looking at here uh, is then how do we get data to help us with this journey? And I've heard over the years, many people come to me and say, we just need all the data. And I sat in a room with many financial people representing probably in aggregate about 15 trillions worth of, of assets worldwide. And they said, look, we just need all the data. I said, well, that's a really useless question. Uh, which data do you need specifically? And they said, just, all we need is all the industry data about infrastructure, so water, energy, agriculture, so on. We just need all the information about finance, all the information about policy, uh, all the geospatial information, <clears throat> Uh, and all the climate data. So, well, that's okay. That's better than all. That's better than everything. At least we can start to sort of chunk that up uh, a little bit. And let's let's then um, pick it out by by sector. Um, and then, how do we get this real economy piece, the actual production of things? So here we've got resources that get distributed, and then they get used in making things. Um, and then, within a carbon world, they get quantified. There's a bunch of methodologies and models that are applied to those consumption pieces, they get put into carbon accounting packages and turned into reports, the kind of TCFD one that I mentioned earlier. Now those reports then also have lots of qualitative statements about the future. So organizations will say, we'll be net zero later. Trust us. Uh, and it's a bit like saying we're definitely going to be profitable in three years. Um, we need to be able to hold people to account bet far better than we are at the moment. It is not a pleasant situation at the moment. I'll give you one example within, within the insurance sector. If you go to the top level of these organizations, they'll all say, oh, yes, we've got a team working on climate change. They're doing forward projections and using AI and machine learning, and probably there's a blockchain somewhere in there as well. If you go in at the ground level, and I've done this uh, more than once now, there's it, it one national insurance company and I went and spoke to the intern, and they said, yeah, I get emailed 15,000 spreadsheets a year from our customers. I copy and paste them into two black box uh, software as a service risk modeling tools. They spit out a number, we take the average, we adjust that based on last year's number, and that's how your insurance premium gets set. Now, as you can tell from that, firstly, what on earth are you doing? Uh, secondly, that's not incorporating at scale all of the future predictions, because when you start factoring those in, it starts to really shake some of the foundations of what the economy should be looking like in the future. And that's why it's hard. It's really difficult for organizations to uh, engage with this, because it really introduces fairly systemic different types of risk. It's also really difficult for countries to then work with each other, because you say, well, if you keep going uh, this way, our country is going to flood. You know, so one of the outcomes uh, that's quite likely, there's plenty of uh, evidence pointing in this direction, that Florida, for example, might be one of the first uh, areas that just becomes, goes underwater. Because the ground in, in a lot of Florida is porous, so you can't even build uh, a levee, it just comes up through the ground. But there's still property development happening on the coast of Florida, it's a bit crazy. But the second the last insurance company pulls out of Florida, the housing market will collapse, and then you'll see a systemic uh, economic collapse uh, in that area. So why we're looking at finance and looking at these kind of financial instruments is because they have to care first. The insurance companies have to care first because they're carrying a lot of the risk. The pension com companies have to care first because they have to protect an investment that lasts decades. And at the moment, when you join these things up, these reports are used by ratings agencies, they're used by investors, they're used by fund managers in the market, and then auditors, at the moment auditors around the world are hiring people with what's called ESG skills, environment, science, and governance uh, skills. Um, so much so they're actually creating a bit of a, a vacuum in the market. They're just hoovering these people up. 
because we all, everybody knows that they're going to have to audit these environmental reports, but they're massively complex. It's right down to how much, was steel, how much steel was consumed in a particular project, what was the carbon intensity at the time of use, and so on. So somehow, we need to digitize this entire system. But digitizing this entire system isn't a technology problem, per se. It is a little bit, because you've got one, some poor soldier who's got 15,000 spreadsheets. But that's a relatively solvable problem compared with the policy instruments you need to put in place to make all this data flow. And so part of the work we're doing at Icebreaker 1 has been to try and take the principles of open banking and, and some of the work we've done at the Open Data Institute forward into policy instruments or into things that could be used in procurement or other uh, financial uh, contexts to help this data flow and to almost mandate it. We'd love investors to mandate the data flow through this system so they can have confidence in what they're investing in. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, just bring that back. So, what can we do, right? So, we've got this something, we've all got a role to play. We're not powerless in the mix. So, I want to come back to the, these kind of asks here, which uh, we touched on uh, at the beginning. Why would we want to ask these questions? Well, because the, the investors, the pension funds in particular, need to know from their stakeholders, which are us, right? They need to know that this is what we want. So we need to be able to articulate the questions to them in a way that is meaningful and creates the right incentives. They also need to have measurable plans. And while some are getting there, there is a vast amount of work to be done. And the UK is actually one of the leaders in this, is, this field. <clears throat> the um, other thing that's happening is regulation is coming. So across the EU, the uh, climate reporting is now mandatory for all large funds affected. There's about 50,000 companies that are affected. In the US, the uh, regulator, the SEC, is now mandating the reporting of climate risk. However, that's at the end of the process. So we've now got to say, well, if you're reporting what the risk is, what are you going to do about it? Right? And there's a world of uh, pain ahead there. And a lot of the capital is frozen because the investors are terrified of greenwash. And it's not just, we, we all hate greenwash, but so do they. They don't, because they don't want to be on the front page of the news with the latest greenwash thing. Also, for their own shareholders, for their own investors, they need to make sure that they're investing in the right thing, but they don't necessarily have the evidence, and they can't necessarily prove what the outcomes are. So there's a huge scope here for innovation and hacking at multiple levels of the system. How can we prove that this particular renewable technology is going to scale? If we can de-risk that, then it will have a huge amount of investment thrown at it. And I think the latest number I've heard, um, actually when I set up Icebreaker, I set as a target of trying to influence $3.6 trillion per annum of investment. Sounded a bit, well, it is a bit ludicrous, but the reason for picking that number is that's roughly how much we spend on infrastructure globally per annum. And it all needs to be demonstrably net zero. The latest numbers coming out of McKinsey is probably three or four times that in terms of the amount of investment it's going to take to get the whole world to get to net zero. So there's a massive amount I think we can do, and this is really <clears throat> call to action for all open communities, developing open source solutions, uh, developing social solutions, developing financial instruments. You know, if you want to go learn about how does an insurance policy work or how does a, an investment product work, we've just spent 18 months working with Lloyds and um, Aon and, and people like that, what is a climate product anyway? All of that's on our website. It's all Creative Commons licensed. And for those working on uh, things like policy, whether it's internally within a, a company or working uh, with local government or working with national government, there's a huge amount to be inserted in there as well. <clears throat> and if you're working inside an organization, just keep asking the question. Just keep socializing these questions. This is the most powerful thing we can do as a community. It's just the more we ask the questions, the more people will feel that they've got permission to step into that space and take more risks, and that will give them confidence to take those risks. So I'm going to finish there. Thank you. We've got 
posters here and stickers if you want, and this presentation is at the link at the top right of the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gavin.